My name is Adam Prado. I'm a park ranger. I work at Herbert Hoover National Historic Site, and I'm broadcasting from Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. And um, so the National Historic Site is actually a national park. The Presidential Library and Museum is within the national park. We're in West Branch, Iowa. It's a little town in eastern Iowa. And um, we're um, we the people at the historic site and the people at the Presidential Library, even though we're two different uh, government organizations, we are partners in telling the story about Herbert Hoover. Um, I hope you've learned a little bit about Herbert Hoover already. Uh, if not, I'll just really quickly, he was the 31st president of the United States. He was born in Iowa, uh, worked around the world uh, before uh, joining government, uh, working for three presidents, and then he was elected president himself. And we're going to talk a little bit about his legacy. That's the theme of this uh, series of presentations. And a president's legacy could be something uh, that the president accomplished when he was in office. Um, but it could be some other things too, things that the president left behind and uh, things that he's remembered for. And one question I, I'd like to pose to you as we get started on this presentation is, do you think presidents have control over how they're remembered? So we'll talk about that a little bit think about whether they have control over how they're remembered and in what ways can they have control over how they're remembered. So this is March 4th, 1933, and uh, Herbert Hoover, uh, this was Herbert Hoover's last day in office, and he accompanied the new president, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, to uh, to the inauguration. Uh, Herbert Hoover was, uh, his last day of president came at the end of four very bad years. And um, the new president uh, won the election because he was able to offer Americans uh, hope uh, that President Hoover had trouble, Herbert Hoover had trouble offering Americans. When Herbert Hoover was elected in 1928, Four years earlier, he was very, very popular. He was already a successful uh, engineer and businessman. He was famous as a humanitarian, helping people during World War I. And he had already worked in the government for three presidents. America was prosperous in the 1920s, and voters thought that Herbert Hoover was the right leader to continue that prosperity and to use that prosperity to improve the lives of Americans. So this is a map of the United States. This is the Electoral College map. And the states that voted for Herbert Hoover are in red. The numbers are the numbers of votes each state uh, had in the Electoral College. So you can see that uh, Herbert Hoover won almost all the states and, uh, and, a, and a huge um, majority of, uh, of electoral votes. Considered a landslide victory. That's the 1932 election. The Great Depression had set in during Hoover's presidency. Many farms and businesses failed, and many were unemployed. President Hoover tried some creative solutions to fix the problems, but he was mostly unsuccessful. By the time he ran for re-election in 1932, he was very unpopular. Many people blamed him for the severity of the Great Depression, and they thought that he was indifferent to their hardships. In this map, the states in red are still the states that voted for Herbert Hoover, and the numbers are the electoral votes for each state. So you can see the change in Herbert Hoover's popularity in the four years he was president. But President Hoover, he was very hurt that people blamed him for things that he thought were out of his control. He was a former president for a long time, over 30 years. So after he left office, after that day, March 4th, 1933, he was a former president for over 30 years. He had spent a lot of that time defending his legacy or trying to show Americans that he made the right decision. So here's another question I want you to think about. If you were Herbert Hoover, if you were in his shoes in 1933, how would you convince people you were right? You want to try to answer it? <laughs> 
but we'll talk a little bit about what Herbert Hoover did. So after he left the presidency, President Hoover wrote books, gave speeches, he ran in presidential elections again, and he supported Republican candidates that he agreed with. So President Hoover was a Republican. He continued his public service work, stuff that he had done before he was president, and he preserved primary resources so we could learn about his life. So remember, uh, primary resources are direct or firsthand evidence of people or events. One of the books he wrote were the memoirs of Herbert Hoover, sort of like an autobiography. President Hoover's memoirs took up three books. The first book is about his life before he became president. The second book, is about his presidency. And the third book of his memoirs is about Herbert Hoover defending all his decisions as president during the Great Depression. All those people had lost jobs and businesses were failing. So in one chapter, he attempted to answer many accusations uh, that Franklin Roosevelt had made against him. One of Roosevelt's most, or as Herbert Hoover said, one of Roosevelt's most effective campaign issues was of course the depression. His strategy was to allege that I had made the depression and then done nothing about it. On this uh, slide, these are some of the, uh, the, this is the chapter title and some of the section titles of the chapter. And you can see by reading them that uh, President Hoover was very interested in making sure his readers understood that he was not to be blamed for the Great Depression. Herbert Hoover actually wrote a lot of books. He probably wrote about 40 books in his lifetime. Um, and these are books that he wrote after he uh, was president. Um, some of them have kind of pessimistic sounding titles like The Challenge to Liberty, Problems of Lasting Peace. Uh, but other ones are a little more fun. Uh, one of the books called On Growing Up that he wrote right at the end of his life uh, was a collection of letters that he had written to uh, children who had written him letters. So these were his answers to their letters. And he usually said things like, usually encouraged them uh, to, to do their best and to go to school. And sometimes he would answer their questions about what it was like to be president. President Hoover even wrote a book about another president, Woodrow Wilson. He's the only president to do that, to write a book about another president. So Herbert Hoover, one of the ways he tried to show people that, that he had done the right thing when he was president is he tried to run for president again. He had only served one term, so he was eligible to run for president one more time. Uh, he thought he could win in 1936, and, uh, but he remained very, very unpopular, and most Republicans would not support nominating as their candidate. William Allen White, whose quote is shown here, was a, a newspaper editor, and he liked Herbert Hoover, but he was also honest about Hoover's chances of being reelected or even getting the nomination uh, from the Republican Party. He said, everything he says, meaning Hoover, as well as everything his friends say is discounted, is unbelievable. And in 1940, Hoover tried again for the Republican nomination, and he did not find much support. And again, the Republicans were not interested in nominating him as a candidate, their candidate for president. They thought that everybody still had a bad memory about the Great Depression and that Hoover's presidency, and they did not want him to represent them. So President Hoover gave up on running for president after that. William Allen Wright, White wrote again, Hoover is poison. He is sort of a political typhoid. Carrier. So Hoover continued his public service. In 1936, he became a chairman and fundraiser for the Boys Club of America, which is now known as the Boys and Girls Club of America. In his first three years, the Boys Clubs built over 100 new clubs in 50 cities. Herbert Hoover liked to joke, the boy is our most precious possession. I think Herbert Hoover remembered that he was an orphan when he was a kid. Uh, he had some hardships growing up. His parents died when he was very young. Family did not have much money, uh, and he enjoyed helping uh, children. 
especially, especially young boys. The Boys and Girls Clubs uh, are still around and they still help kids become positive, caring, and responsible citizens. That's their mission. In 1946, President Truman, the new president, sent Herbert Hoover to survey world food supplies and food needs after World War II. Here are children greeting him in Poland. In Poland, he was still popular from his humanitarian work after World War I. A lot of people remember Herbert Hoover not as a president, but as a humanitarian. After that trip where he visited dozens of countries, he made a recommendation that the United Nations set up an organization to, as he said, focus attention on the needs of the children, which it did in 1947. So the United Nations set up an organization called UNICEF, and that, uni that organization, UNICEF, still works around the world today to help children. Another thing Herbert Hoover did was work a lot with Stanford University, where he went to college. He helped them raise money, and he was especially involved with the library he established there after the First World War. He called it the War Library, but it's usually known now as the Hoover Institution. In that photo, it's that big tower behind President Hoover, and it's a place where people go to research. He collected a lot of papers during the First World War because he wanted uh, people to be able to read about it and learn from it so it wouldn't happen again. President Hoover returned to government to work for new presidents. So he worked with both Presidents Truman and President, President Eisenhower to better organize the federal government. Did that twice in about 10 years. So that brought Herbert Hoover's uh, list of five. If, if you're counting how many presidents that he worked for, he worked for five presidents. So the Hoovers would sometimes visit West Branch, Iowa, where the president was born. That's where I'm broadcasting from. Uh, and in that town is a, a little two-room house where President Hoover was born in 1874. So in 1935, the president and his wife bought the house where he was born so that it could be a historic site where people would learn about Herbert Hoover. That's part of the National Historic Site today. The Hoovers had it restored to look the way it did when president, the president was born in 1874. Mrs. Hoover, President Hoover's wife, researched how the house would have looked and was furnished in 1874 so people could see where the president started out. The Hoovers continued to visit West Branch occasionally. They would visit the restored birthplace and the historic site that was developing around it. Uh, sometimes they would visit schools that were named after President Hoover. People of West Branch sometimes invited him to celebrate his birthday here. And during his 80th birthday, he spoke about the birthplace cottage, the house where he was born. And this is what he said, that this cottage where I was born is physical proof of the unbounded opportunity of American life. Uh, as you can see, that, uh, that cottage, it's very small. It's only two rooms. On the inside, President Hoover, when he was a very little kid, lived there with his older brother and his younger sister, and they all lived in that little house together until he was about three and a half years old. And he wanted to show people that he started out in a little tiny house in a small town that nobody had ever heard of and still grew up to be president of the United States. President Hoover's last visit to West Branch was in 1962 when he was 88 years old. And this is a picture of him at the birthplace cottage with his children, his grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Four generations of Hoovers there. After uh, the Hoovers restored the birthplace, they also sent a statue that belonged to President Hoover. The statue was a gift from the people of Belgium with that the people sent in gratitude after World War I for President Hoover's humanitarian work. The statues of an Egyptian goddess called Isis, goddess of life. And it looks a little out of place in this historic site in rural Iowa, but it represents an important accomplishment of Hoover's, feeding millions of people during the World War. 
President Hoover thought it was important that visitors to his birthplace saw this accomplishment. The park later added a blacksmith shop modeled on the one owned by Herbert Hoover's father. Uh, President Hoover's father died young, but he was an enterprising businessman. Somebody found a horseshoe from the old blacksmith shop and presented it to Herbert Hoover. That's a picture of him accepting that horseshoe. We have blacksmiths who work at the blacksmith shop today, and they demonstrate the kind of skill and creativity that Herbert's father used to support their family when they lived in that little house. West Branch's oldest schoolhouse is also part of the park or historic site. President Hoover thought that education was essential to good citizenship and success. President Hoover often praised his teachers in speeches, and he maintained a friendship with Mrs. Brown, one of his childhood teachers, whom he visited with during trips to West Branch. Mrs. Brown is in the front seat. She's wearing a hat, her head uh, turned away from the camera. But President Hoover and, and Lou Hoover, uh, his wife, are in the back seat. That's a visit to West Branch in 1928 when Herbert Hoover was running for president. Also part of the historic site is the Friends Meeting House where Herbert Hoover's Quaker family worshiped. Hoover recalled that Quakers were hardworking, productive people who believed in serving others. He also said that sitting through the long silent worship meetings as a child was strong training in patience. Herbert Hoover wanted his presidential library to be in West Branch also. President Hoover thought that presidential libraries were a great idea. Documents from his presidency are stored there, stored here and may be studied for research. He believed that by reading them, people would realize he made the right decisions when he was president. When the museum opened in 1962, former President Truman joined, joined President Hoover at the dedication. Most people don't get to visit museums about themselves, but President Hoover did. And in this photo, there are uh, there's a big crowd at the museum, and right in the middle is President Hoover. Entering uh, right next to him with his back turned is Harry Truman. Like a lot of us, President Hoover didn't like to think about dying. His son, Alan, though, thought it was important to plan for the president's burial. President Hoover agreed to be buried in West Branch in the park where his birthplace and presidential library already were. This is a model of the gravesite before it was built, and it doesn't look too different from that now. President Hoover died in 1964. Thousands of people came to see his burial in West Branch. They even lined up along the highways from the Cedar Rapids Airport to West Branch to watch the funeral procession. That's a photograph of his burial in 1964. And here is the gravesite of President Mrs. Hoover today. So they're buried under the two stone tablets uh, in the middle of the plantings there. And it's a very simple gravesite compared to some other president's grave. They overlook, the graves there overlook the birthplace cottage from the small hill. So you can see where he was born. So all these things are in the historic site. President Hoover's birthplace, the blacksmith shop of his father, the schoolhouse, and the friends meeting house. The Presidential Library and Museum is situated right in the middle of all that, uh, and not too far from where the President and First Lady are buried. And all those things kind of show what President Hoover's uh, legacy was. These are the things that Herbert Hoover actually left behind, not just things he did when he was President, but things that he left for us to, uh, to consider when we learn about him. One thing, another question I'd like you to try to answer or think about at least are, what are the advantages of Herbert Hoover's birthplace, museum, and gravesite all being in the same place? 